Thank you, Scott. Thank you, musicians, for leading us so well. Appreciate that. I love that all of us get to be the worship team. The audience is God. And these faithful musicians and uh, techies in the back serve us so well week in, week out. I want to give you a little bit of a roadmap for where we're going Sunday mornings in our teaching. It will be mid-January when we begin our verse-by-verse exposition of the book of Revelation. And just as a heads up, we've been reading the book of Revelation publicly in our reading of Scripture on Sunday mornings, and we're almost done with that. And my encouragement to you in preparation for a verse-by-verse study of the book of Revelation is simply to read it. So between now and mid-January, the more times you can just simply read the book of Revelation and get it under your belt, the more prepared you will be for our study of it together as a church. In fact, the book of Revelation opens with this invitation and blessing, blessed is the one or happy is the one who reads and who heeds the things written in the book. So that is an encouragement to all of us to prepare for that study. In the meantime, Sunday mornings, we'll be doing a seven-part series on caring for each other in the body of Christ. And so this morning will be the first installment of that. I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, teaching that's coming again in mid-January while we'll be starting the book of Revelation here on Sunday mornings. On Sunday nights, we'll be doing a study of the entire Bible book by book. So not a verse by verse exposition of a book, but a book by book exposition of the Bible. 66 Sunday nights in a row. Uh, We'll be looking at one book at a time. So you'll have an opportunity to hear the entirety of Genesis in one sermon. Uh, That will be the elders, some of our seminary students, um, elder interns, uh, a group of men teaching a book at a time through 66 Sunday nights. And between here and there, I I hope you're coming Sunday nights. uh, Now, Omri Miles is opening up the book of Zephaniah verse by verse. So I invite you just to come back uh, tonight, 6 p.m. for evening service as we work through Zephaniah. I want to give you a bit of an overview before we jump into this morning's passage of this caring for each other in the body of Christ series. We'll begin this morning in Ephesians chapter four, but you need to understand that the Christian life or following Jesus being part of his church is not a spectator sport. It is not a consumer activity. To follow Jesus means to have been born again by the Spirit of God and placed sovereignly by the Spirit of God into a local body of believers. And the church, as she gathers, is not a place where consumers come and receive a product by well-trained experts dispensing said product. The church gathers corporately, visibly, locally, publicly in order to be equipped for ministry and the ministry of Christians in the body of Christ. And there's a reason body is used as a metaphor for interdependent, organic, interconnected members. We serve one another. We care for one another in the same way that if you stubbed your toe, your whole body would resonate with the pain When one part of the body is missing or malfunctioning, the whole body feels it. That's God's design for the church. So we're going to refresh our hearts and renew our minds on what it means to be a part of a body in a local church, what it means to care for one another. And this morning, we're beginning broadly with Ephesians 4.16, what it means to be organically attached to a local body of believers. And every one of us has a part in the health and growth of the church. And we'll get there in a moment. Installment two, uh, Lord willing, next week will be Hebrews chapter 10. And the thought there is you are your brother's keeper and the stakes are high. We talked a couple of weeks ago about discipleship. And we remembered then that discipleship is intrusive by nature. We are to be in each other's lives. We are to be about each other's business. And yes, Christian, you are your brother's keeper. That's installment number two. Installment number three will come from Galatians 6, 1 to 3. And that is, if anyone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one with a spirit of gentleness. 
And the idea there is not that you catch each other in various sins, like a spy. But you've noticed that your brother or sister in Christ is caught in a sin that is destructive. How do you tenderly, gently, spiritually, genuinely, unhypocritically, with self-examination, full of care and love, help your brother or sister in Christ out of the trap that is sin? We'll look next at 2 Timothy 2. And what kind of character ought to be pursued in our lives when we jump into that which is difficult in the life of the church? The likelihood that we will offend one another, sin against one another, cause trouble because we are sinners saved by grace, not yet perfected, rubbing up against each other in close proximity. The likelihood that we will sin against each other is very high. In fact, I would contend if you're not sinning against others in the body of Christ, you're not close enough. That's not an endorsement of your sin. That is a recognition of our proximity as sinners under the banner of grace with one another. That is as it ought to be. So what kind of people ought we to be when we enter into difficult things in the body of Christ? That's installment four. Installment five will be a rehearsal of the church discipline process from Matthew 18. Four steps that Jesus gives as a procedure for helping see each other's blind spots, all with the goal of restoration. Installment six will be the church discipline process, step five. What I mean by that is the pastoral encouragement that Paul gives in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 to restore the brother who was sinning under the church discipline process when he is repentant and to be brought back into the church and there is to be a party. (laughs) A restoration, forgiveness, and love, and much is at stake in that. And then a final installment will be a a look at the process of Titus 3, 10, and 11. What is all of our role in diffusing factions in the church? Those things which fracture relationships and bring harm to the testimony of the church and the good of God's people. So that's sort of a roadmap of where we're going with this series. I want to turn your attention to Ephesians chapter four. And this morning we're looking at your part in the health and growth of the church. Put your eyes on Ephesians 4, 16 with me this morning. I'll read it. And then we will ask God's help as we study this. From Christ, the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning and we ask for your help. We ask for your help because we need it. We recognize in this moment that we are frail, weak, imperfect, blunt instruments. And we pray to be instruments in your hands, in the care of one another's lives, in the context of your church. Lord Jesus, this is your church. You are the head. This is your body. That we are members of one another under you. And we seek to have your values. We seek to align our thoughts with yours. We, we long to put ourselves, our procedures, our lives, our conduct under your governance, under your care. We're so thankful that you've given us something of a blueprint for the church so that we're not left to wander according to our own devices, our own schemes or plans or conventional wisdom. We pray, O oh God, that we would attain that unity that you prescribe for us, the unity which is found in alignment with you. And we pray that as we look to one another and we see our differences, that our resolution of difficulties and our renewing of minds unto the making smaller our differences, our growth in unity would not be a compromise with one another so much as a greater alignment with you for surely Lord Jesus, as we draw closer to you 
and align our hearts and our thoughts with yours, we will find ourselves much closer to one another. We pray for that by the power of your spirit. Help us to see and benefit from your word this morning. And we pray it in Jesus name. Amen. This morning, we're looking at the part that you play in the health and growth of the church. And this is important. I want to turn your attention to Ephesians 4.11, just up the page, the top of the paragraph there. And Paul records that Jesus gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers for a specific purpose. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. A saint in Ephesians 4.12 is simply a Christian, a set apart one, one who has been purchased by the gospel. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are a saint already. You don't have to die and under some sort of medieval uh, idea, do some miracles and then be called a saint and then have a holiday after your name. Every Christian is a saint. And the work of a pastor, the work of teachers, leaders in the church, and the work of those foundational ministries of apostles and prophets in the first century... They were given by Jesus to the church for the equipping of Christians to do the work of the ministry. The ministry is not the job of the elders of this church, the pastors of this church. The ministry is the task of every Christian in this church. And so the pastors of this church seek to equip all of us to do the work of the ministry. And what's on display in Ephesians 4 is the growth of the church. And when I mention church growth, I I hope you are interested in church growth. Uh, For if you are interested in, I like what it is right now and I don't ever want it to change. I'm going to tell you, you do not have Jesus heart for the church because the church is not the permanent institution of God's people. It is not perfected. It is not what it should be. The church is always to be growing in greater conformity to the new Testament and we're not perfect. So we must grow. Sometimes when we hear the words church growth, we think of growth in numbers, the expansion of some empire, bigger buildings, bigger budgets. That's not what Jesus has in mind here in Ephesians chapter four. But we ought to be concerned that the church grow, grow in its maturity, grow in its adherence to Christ and grow in expansion for the church is the vehicle by which Jesus is bringing people to himself from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. The work of the church is not done if hypothetically, impossibly, somehow a local body of believers in Tempe reached ecclesiological perfection. The church must yet expand to the ends of the earth. Now, there are church growth strategies out there. How do we get more people in the door? Maybe we could use all the tools of consumer marketing, you know, evaluate the trends of consumer interest, evaluate our marketing and advertising reach, evaluate the product that we're offering. Does it meet the felt needs of the audience we're trying to reach? What should we do with our music and our lighting, our ambiance? We should have relevant preaching and celebrity speakers, shorter sermons or no sermons at all. We ought to engage in entertaining and non-intrusive content that makes people um, comfortable, makes no demands on the listener. We ought to do things that are more convenient or novel and exciting. And, And if that's the approach that one were to take to grow the church, those kinds of things require gurus, dollars, strategies, planning, leadership, bureaucracies, musicians, props, technologies, writers, I hope you've noticed already that I do not have a team of writers by me in sermon prep. Theatrics, planners, we need hype, advertising, slogans, marketers, billboards, mailings. All of those kinds of things could grow a crowd. You can hype, hype. But that is not the growth that is detailed here in Ephesians 4. That we need to allow the New Testament to be the blueprint. No need to reinvent church growth nor strategies for achieving it. We're not thinking primarily about numbers and buildings and empires and activities and programs. But the kind of growth Jesus is interested in, the kind of growth he designs is outlined for us in Ephesians 4. I, I won't read all of that here this morning, but I will summarize it for you. Pastors are given for the equipping of the saints so that Christians grow in 
a knowledge of the son of God, a maturity. That's the individualized maturity in Christ and a collective maturity in keeping with the fullness of Christ. Jesus is the standard. Are we there yet? That is what we must grow in. That growth involves not being like children. That is not being gullible or vulnerable to every trend or every doctrine, every theology, every idea that blows through town. Growth means speaking the truth in love to each other. And Paul says growing means growing up in all aspects into Jesus, who is the head of the church. And that kind of growth can't be measured by numbers of people in attendance, by rows of cars in a parking lot, by the size of a budget, the size of a building, by programs, activities, or online followers, or by how many bumper stickers show up in the morning commute. Jesus is interested in church growth. And Jesus has a plan to grow his church, and it is laid out plainly for us in his word. And the blueprint blueprint is right here. And and really the punchline on the blueprint is in the text we're looking at this morning. One verse, Ephesians 4.16. We might ask the question, how then does the church grow? I mean, mechanically, how is it supposed to happen? And this verse answers that question. If you were to ask whose job is it to grow the church, to maintain the health of the church, you might answer, well, Jesus, it's his job to grow the church. And you would be right. And you might say it's the job of church leaders to see that the church grows and is healthy. And again, you would be right. But in Ephesians 4.16, the focus demonstrates to us that church growth requires not gadgets and gurus, not marketing firms and management teams, not billboards and bumper stickers, but you, Christian. The growth and health of a local church demands you. And I'll give you the punchline here up front, and then we'll unfold this verse. It means that you, Christian, must be operating properly And connected to other Christians vitally in the local church. That's God's blueprint. Blue, I can't say that word. I'm not going to say it anymore. Plan. (laughs) For church growth. That you, Christian, operate properly. And that you intentionally, regularly, organically join yourself to other believers. That's God's design. So read again with me, Ephesians 4, 16, from Christ, the whole body being fitted and held together by every joint of supply, according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now, this is a giant jumble of words. If you're a grammarian, you may already be diagramming this verse in your own mind and good for you if you have done it you will have discovered that the subject of this sentence is the body and the verb is causes the body causes something. The body causes the growth of the body. In other words, what causes church growth? The church, the church causes the growth of the church. And how does it do that? You've got this middle grouping of words describing how that happens. The proper working of each individual part and those parts joined together for a vitality of power that causes the growth. The church causes the growth of the church. Sometimes we think of ministry service in the church only in terms of an official capacity, a title, a program, some position. That's not what Ephesians 4.16 has in mind in particular. There's something more basic in our service than some official ministry position. There's an element of our service that is to be organic, non-official, personal, relational. And we will find that that is where the energizing supply of power for the growth of the church and for the vitality and health of the church is found. Your part in the health and the growth of the church, uh, we can divide this up in Ephesians 4.16 in terms of an outline into four directives. Four directives this morning for understanding your part in the health and growth of the church. We'll briefly get through the first three. We'll spend more time on the last one. The first directive for you to be a part of the growth and vitality of the local church is to recognize the source 
of church growth. Recognize the source of church growth. This comes from the first two words of verse 16, from whom? And the whom there is a reference to Christ in verse 15, right there in the immediate context. From Christ, the whole body causes the growth of the body. Jesus is the source of church growth. And according to Ephesians 4, he's not merely the source of it. He's also the equipper. Verse 11, it was Jesus that gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers for the equipping of saints. Jesus is the one who outfits the church with leaders who in turn equip all of us to do the work of the ministry. Jesus is also the focal point of the church in verse 13 until we attain the unity of the knowledge of the son of God. Knowing God through Jesus the Christ is the central task of the church. Jesus is also the standard of maturity in the church. Verse 13, we are to grow to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Jesus is the goal of the growth of the church. We are to grow up in all aspects into him. And Jesus is the authority over the church. Verse 15, he is the head, even Christ. He is authoritative. He provides for the church. He gives direction to the church. All is under him. In verse 16, Paul makes it clear that Jesus is the source of the growth of the church. Whatever our part, whatever our service, whatever our labors, Jesus Christ said he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How does he set about to do that? Through us, through you, Christian. Here's the second directive Remember the purpose of church growth. What is the purpose of church growth? This is found in the phrase here at the end, the building up of the whole church. That is the purpose. We, we cause the growth of the body by being joined together, properly working. And notice what Paul says at the end of this verse, the, the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Why must the church grow? There is a self-interest in the grammar here. The church causes unto itself or for its own advantage, the growth of the body. That is a mature, healthy, growing, vibrant church lives up to its purpose for being a church on the earth. Frankly, to be a lampstand for the gospel in a dark world. And a growing, vital, that is lively, alive church functions according to its purpose. So when the body is growing, it is growing for its own benefit. The whole body collectively comprised of all the constituent parts together brings about for itself, its own growth for the purpose of building up the whole. So the church is seen as an organism whose various parts are operating in unison to bring about the development of the whole body. Can you imagine a physical body whose individual parts were out of sorts? Uh, They were not in keeping with the purpose of the whole. Uh, Maybe one part of your body was intent on self aggrandizement over and against the development of the whole body. Maybe an elbow says, I'm going to be the big deal. I'm going to be the big deal around here. (laughs) And it grows out of proportion with the rest. What do we call it when one part of a human body grows out of proportion with the other parts? It is disease. It's a cancer. And these kinds of things are crippling to the rest of the body. What about when one part of the body fails to grow? It's stunted. Again, this is crippling disease and malformation. You see, your part in the body of Christ is not designed by God to be individualistic. You have not been rescued by God for the purpose of serving yourself. You have not been placed by God into the body, equipped by church leaders, nor gifted by the Holy Spirit in order to serve you. Your service in the church is not primarily about you. A friend pointed out to me a number of years ago that we are really bad astronomers. We tend to think of the universe As revolving around us. I'm the center of it. That's just the way the universe works. That's not the way the universe works. And that's not the way the church works. The purpose of church growth. The purpose of your part in serving the church. Is the growth of the whole body. Christian do you see yourself that way? My role here is to see that the church grows. And is healthy. 
Any strategy for church growth that is content to draw inordinate attention to one member or is content to leave individual members stagnant, struggling, helpless, does not meet God's purpose for the growth of the church. Here's a third directive. We ought to maintain the climate of church growth. What is the climate? What is the atmosphere in which the church is to grow and flourish? The last two words of verse 16. In love. That's the arena of church vitality and growth. It is the atmosphere in love has to do with the climate in which the church will thrive and grow as God intends. And love here in Ephesians 4, 16, it is not about the gushy feelings we get when we're around people that we like. It is love from God producing love for God, resulting in love to one another in the body of Christ. It is selfless, sacrificial, self-emptying Love. And don't miss this little prepositional phrase. If love has left the building, you can be assured that whatever is happening in the organization is not true church growth. If love is to be the atmosphere for the growth of the church, then the quality of the growth of any church may be tested by the reality of its love, love for God, love expressed between its members and love towards the outside. One commentator said this love then becomes the criterion for an assessment of the church's true growth. In fact, if you think forward to the book of revelation, Jesus wrote a letter to this church, the church at Ephesus. And he said, I have something against you. You have left the love you had at the first. And Jesus warned the church at Ephesus. If you don't fix that, you don't get to be a church anymore. The atmosphere of love is critical to the life and vitality and biblical growth of a local church. The final directive, and here's where we'll spend most of our time, is simply this command. Be the cause of church growth. Christian, be the cause of church growth. That's the implication here from this text. If the whole body causes the growth of the body, and that growth is dependent on these big phrases in the middle of the verse, then that involves you and me. It involves us doing what we should be doing as an individual Christian. And it means joining our lives to others in organic relationship. And the growth and health of the church depends on it. Look at verse 16. From Christ, the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body. A growing body is described in this way, fitted and held together, every part working, and the joints, the joining becomes a supply of energizing power. The church here is described like a physical body. It's an apt metaphor. Paul uses it in a number of other letters in the New Testament. It's appropriate because it describes an an organization of interdependent parts interconnected with one another. And here it is called the whole body. That is the collective organism is in view. There is unity and diversity in the church. There are various parts. They look different than one another. They function different than one another. And yet there is one body. And in the local church, there is diversity among us, ethnically, socially, and gifting. We are different personalities. We have different histories and experiences. And God has put us together in one organism. And the church is described as an entire body built by God. And and here Paul changes the metaphor from organic chemistry, if you will, to architecture. And the words here are used to describe stones that are tightly fit together. Stonework in ancient construction, if a building was to be sturdy, required very finely detailed cutting of stone so that they fit together and would not move. The stone walls that exist throughout Middle Tennessee, and you can see them to this day in Nashville, they're built without mortar. They are specially selected and tightly fitted stones that have stood the test of time because they've been fitted together by an expert wall builder. That is the picture here. And then Paul says, not only are they fitted together, but they are 
held together. And and this goes back to medical terminology in in Paul's usage here. Uh, Being held together was uh, medical terms used in his day for those organic parts that were compacted, knit together, interwoven, and solid. And all of this is present tense. We are being fitted together and we are being held together in an ongoing way. And it is also passive. That means these things are being done with us or to us. And the implication with a passive like this in the New Testament is God is the one doing it. God is fitting us together and holding us together. And it's clear from passages like this that the New Testament does not have a category of a solo Christian. A lone wolf Christian, the cowboy Christian, the off doing your own thing rogue kind of Christian. But God's design is that believers are to be fitted together, to be interwoven next to each other in the church. A Christian not vitally connected to a local church is actually disobedient to Jesus commands, dismembered from Jesus purpose and distant from Jesus power. His purpose and his power are located right here when we are knit to one another in the local church. We are to be interwoven, tightly compacted, interdependent, like a physical body, organically connected. Charles Simeon wrote, believers are no more independent of each other than they are of Christ. As they are united to him by faith, so they must be united to each other by love. Notice the second description in verse 16. By every joint of supply, according to the proper working of each individual part. The body fitted and joined together causes the growth of the body or makes the growth, does the growth. And we can examine this growth by asking several questions. By what means does the body grow? And to what degree does the body grow? We might ask, how does this work? And how well does it work? Let's ask first, how does this work mechanically? And Paul says, by every joint of supply or by what every joint supplies. And don't think in Paul's terminology here of elbows and knees, the way we think of joints today. The word for joint here that Paul uses is something more like a ligament. It's, it's points of contact in a physical body, wherever two different parts in a body connect to each other. And in the illustration of the church, this describes where we as believers rub up against one another. In those connection points, there is a supply of life and vitality and energy for the growth of the whole body. And the word supply here is a word which means abundant provision. The places where we join our lives to one another in the church are the means by which the parts of the body are fitted and held together. God fits us, holds us together, and produces life through that fitting from him through us to one another. And the unified connectedness of all of this causes the growth of the whole. So where you and I come together in the body of Christ are where vitality and life and energy for spiritual growth are found. Jesus fuels it. We're connected. It comes through those connections. How well are you connected to the body of Christ, to other members in the body? Do you feel lost when someone is missing? Do others feel lost when you are not here? How well are you connected to other members of the body throughout the week? Is church life for you something that happens in a programmed way on an hour on a Sunday morning? Or do you see yourself as a vital part of a body that is interconnected and interdependent throughout the week? No part of the body is unneeded. No part of the body is superfluous. Every member has been placed by God into this body for his purposes and for the growth of the whole. We have to ask not just how does it work? That's at the joints of supply, but how well does it work? And notice what Paul says, according to the proper working of each individual part, literally the measured working back in verse seven, Jesus had given a measure of giftedness to every member of the body of Christ. And here that, that measure is to be working according to its abilities. You see that individual physical body does not work well when individual parts are not working well. 
A number of years ago, Jacob Handler introduced me to the coagulation cascade. And I know you're familiar with it, whether or not you would know the vocabulary, when you have experienced a cut or abrasion, and then you get a scab. It's a really remarkable process when Skin is cut and bleeding begins. There is a vascular spasm. It is instantaneous and lasts for about 20 to 30 seconds. The blood uh, begins working over time. Inside the blood being carried along is something called a platelet plug. Platelets flowing in the bloodstream come in contact with damaged vascular surface and they begin to swell creating a plug. They, they grow weird protrusions and they get sticky and they begin to stick to one another. And blood coagulation or a clot forms in three to six minutes. In 30 minutes to an hour, the clot retracts and it pulls broken surfaces together. It begins to mend the wound and eventually the clot will dissolve or turn into fibrous tissue and fall off. Every part of that process involves complex chemical processes, chemical activators, and clotting factors. By the way, a timeout on the Ephesians 4.16 sermon. If you think about what it would require in evolutionary development to come up with all of these factors and all of these steps and all of these schemes, each one of which by itself would be lethal to an organism, it makes evolution impossible. Okay, enough of that. Time in. Back to Ephesians 4.16. I want to think about this pragmatically for a moment. Positively speaking, if you have an individual who is reading her Bible, spending time with God in prayer, she is being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit into greater Christ likeness. She is boasting in the gospel. She's loving and telling others about Jesus and all that he's done for her. What happens when you bump into her at church in small group or at a coffee shop? All of that life, all of that proper working of an individual spiritual life spills out on you. Spiritual life, energy, vitality, all of that from God overflowing into the life of another member of the body. And the point of connection is the channel of spiritual supply for growth. And not just for her, but for those she's connected to. So when you get excited about reading uh, God's word, you tell someone else about it, who benefits? Well, the person you're interacting with benefits from your growth in God's word. And friend, you benefit in addition. You're excited about Christ. You're telling someone about Christ who loves Christ. They're excited that you're excited about Christ and you get more excited. Do you understand it? It's greater than the sum of its parts. If your if your growth factor, if your growth level is at a two, and you're interacting with someone, and they're at a two, two plus two doesn't equal four; it equals six point seven or something else. There is a a remarkable amount of growth that happens in the contagion of us being together and experiencing growth in Christ. It's exponential. So, what kinds of conversations do you have with other believers? This is precisely the kind of application Paul has in mind. You can look at verses 14 and 15. We're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine. But we are to be speaking the truth in love and grow up in all aspects into Jesus, who is the head. We're to be talking truth to one another, which means you as an individual Christian need to be Drawing in truth, growing in truth, growing in discernment, knowing the difference between right and wrong, clinging to God's word, pursuing him. And then we speak these things to one another. This is ministry. The members of the body joined together and working for mutual growth. The ministry that is described here is not about a title in the church, a position, a task, some delegated responsibility, something programmed. It is about each individual channeling spiritual life from Jesus to each other, being conduits of God's truth and love and life in the church. That is the fuel for church growth. Think about it negatively for a moment. Think about an individual who stagnates in his growth in Christ. 
doesn't want to be around God's people that much. He's not exercising shepherding care over his own heart. He's not reading his Bible. Maybe he's reading his Bible just to check off a box or win an argument. He's not truly meeting with God in his pursuit of Bible reading. His prayer life is languishing. His heart is not being refreshed in dependence upon God. He's living life in his own strength. His life is consumed by temporal concerns, school, work, relationships, entertainment. He has forgotten that life is short, that hell is real, and that heaven is home. He's living for the now. His affections for Jesus are cold. He seldom reflects on the death of Jesus in his place. He, he forgets the rescue that was purchased for him by God at the cross. He has let sin go unchecked. And now when he bumps into other believers, what is the effect? A channel of life and vitality and excitement about Christ and, and contagious growth? And quite the opposite. The stunting of all of those things and the crippling of the body of Christ. You see, Christian, your life is not just about you. You, believer, have been placed into a body by God. And Jesus is very concerned that his body grow to maturity. And the means by which the body grows to maturity is the body itself fitted together by every joint of the supply according to the proper working of each individual part. How well does the church grow? Depends on how well we're connected to one another and how well the individual parts are functioning. Your Bible reading in the morning is not just about you. The state of your heart has an effect on the other members in the church. Is the growth of the church an individual or group effort? Yes. The beauty of that is the that we grow together. The danger of that is that we falter together. So Christian, how well are you working? How well are you operating? Is your individual Christian life working properly? And then is it connected to others in the body of Christ? You may be asking what, what's a really good way to be involved I, I, I can't have this sort of organic, relational, intimate connection to every person in the body of Christ. How, how do I find a subset of people in this local church and be involved in their lives? I'm so glad you asked. You should be in a small group. It's not the only way to benefit from the joint of supply and the vitality of growth, but it is a really good way. And if you're not connected to a small group at Grace Bible Church, I just want to encourage you. There's a sheet at the information table with geographical locations and times that they meet. There may be some new small groups on the horizon. You need to be involved in one. You need to be a participant in one. Your, your life needs to be up against other lives in the body of Christ to accomplish these very things. It's critical to the life and vitality of the church. What's the reality when we get close to each other? We'll step on each other's toes. Our personalities will rub each other the wrong ways. Our sins unchecked will become offenses in the lives of others. God knows that. Those things aren't a surprise to him. Maybe you've checked out of body life because you've been burned. Maybe you've gone to church and you said, I'm never doing that again. These people are all hypocrites. Jesus has a plan and a procedure for de to dealing with our hypocrisies. But I'm convinced if we're not sinning against each other and enjoying the benefits of confession and repentance and forgiveness, things the world doesn't know anything about and we get as gifts. If we're not close enough to offend each other, then we're not close enough according to God's plan in the church. We've got to be in each other's lives. You may stiff arm this plan because you think, oh, that's so intrusive. People might know what I think. <laughs> well, yeah. People might be surprised if they know who I really am. Not as much as you think. Look, we, we're sinners. <laughs> Saved by grace, 
under the reign of grace, growing in grace, looking to Jesus. We should fully expect that being close to people would mean being sinned against. Being close to people would mean I sin against them. And, and then we just follow the biblical, biblical prescriptions for what to do next. And we get to be a group of people together as an interconnected, interdependent organism that is so unlike anything humanity knows. It's unique and it's beautiful according to Jesus' plan. Why is the goal of church growth the building up of itself in love? Because the church is to reflect its head. The church as a body is to look like the head of the church, Jesus Christ, whose values and governance flavor the church. Jesus loves sinners. Jesus loves sinners, as Ashley described earlier in our service, by coming to earth in the flesh to become the actual payment for our sins before a holy God. Jesus did not wait till we cleaned ourselves up, till we got ourselves acceptable, presentable, perfect, even nice to be around. Jesus took us when we were at our worst and we were enemies of him and sent his son to die in our place. If you're a Christian, you know the grace of God. You have become confronted already with your ugliness in your sin and your rebellion against God. You're not a stranger to these things. So to join your life to others who revel in those same truths, it's safe. It's a good place to be. You know, you want to know where real hypocrisy is. Outside the church, when people don't admit that they're sinners, they don't want to come to that reality. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. That's offensive. Well, then there's no remedy. And you just live with the lie that we're all okay. Listen, humanity is not okay. To involve yourself in the life of the church is to involve yourself with a group of people who have said, yeah, I'm not okay. And you're not okay. And Jesus is great. And he saves. And we grow in him together. Listen, in a physical body, My hands are not supposed to be just doing whatever they want. They are to be directed by my brain. And when parts of a physical body act contrary to the desires of the head or contrary to the well-being of other parts of the body, we call that disease. The same is true in the body of Christ. If you're serving right now at Grace Bible Church in some official capacity, some ministry, That is wonderful. There there are many needs. If you don't have an official place to serve, there there are programs that need servants. Uh, We need people to help with the grill out and cook out we'll have on December 4th. We have people to help with the needs in next generation ministries. That's our children's ministry. Uh, You can sign up to be a teacher. You can sign up to be a classroom helper. If you don't have a place to serve, uh, you might look around and notice that there's a lot of kids in this church. That is a place of significant ministry needs. Inquire about that. You can use the little perforated bulletin card, tear that off. You can fill it out, drop it in the offering boxes at the back of the room and say, hey, I want to serve kids. Pay attention to your bulletin. There are ministry needs that come through there and servants needed. You can sign up for any of those official capacity servant positions. Ask a ministry leader, ask your small group leader, ask the, the, the faithful servants in next generation ministries. I think we may have a need for people to be involved in a rotation on Sunday cleanup. What happens after we all leave the building and go get lunch? Somebody vacuums, somebody turns out the lights. You can be in a rotation to help those servants. In any of those service opportunities, I want to encourage you, Christian, to actually serve. And what I mean by that is actually be a part of the body of Christ, properly working, worshiping as an individual, worshiping Christ vertically in your service and benefiting others from that vertical perspective. Maybe your small group uh, does music and, and maybe you're the third string triangle player for the praise team in your small group Bible study. That opportunity of service is not an opportunity for you to demonstrate how skilled you are at the triangle. 
to draw attention to triangulation. But to actually worship Christ and to serve a body of believers. You've been given gifts by the Holy Spirit and placed into a body of Christ for the edification of the body. Not a platform for the edification of self. So in those official service capacities, make sure that your service isn't all about your talents. Make sure that you are growing in love for God and your knowledge of him through his word. And then spill out onto the lives of those that you serve. If you're looking for a place to serve in the church, you may ask one of the pastors here, a ministry leader, a small group leader. Hey, where can I serve? You might get a response like, hmm. I don't know. Let me think about that. Uh, you, you might hear somebody say, uh, the nursery is completely staffed. We have way too many drummers. The bathrooms are spotless. The shut-ins are visited so much and so often they're asking for some me time, a little personal space. You know, every residence within a seven mile radius of this church is evangelized every week by the team that goes out on Friday mornings. You know, the ASU outreach ministry is overstaffed. Don't even bother. The lines in the parking lot got repainted last week. I don't know if there's anything I official I can give you. I don't think that'll happen. But if that were to happen, do not lose heart, Christian. Because the real ministry in the church, inside and alongside of, outside of, and with all of those other things we could describe, is that you worship the Lord and you join yourself in real relationship to other believers in this church. And cause the growth of the body. That's real ministry. That's the aim of the pastors in this church. To equip you to do those things. It doesn't require a title, a position, a task list, or a name badge. You see, caring for one another in the church is the blueprint Jesus laid down for the growth and health of his church. And ultimately for its expansion to the ends of the earth. And it requires each one of us functioning properly. And each one of us connected. It requires you, Christian, growing in your love for God and knowledge of his word, being joined to others in real relationship. This is the mechanism Jesus has given. This is his design, and we can trust him in it. The byproduct of following Jesus' blueprint is an organism unlike anything the world knows. An organization that God uses to bring about supernatural things. And a community of love and fondness and joy that will never be diminished. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the church. We thank you that you purchased the church with your own blood. That you chose to bring together Jew and Gentile into one body. Calling it one new man. A mystery unknown in the Old Testament. And that that church has grown and spread and multiplied and expanded from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, even to Tempe. We pray that this process would not end here in some sort of cul-de-sac, but would continue to multiply to the ends of the earth, to the ends of this age. And we trust, Lord Jesus, what you have promised, that you would be with us in your power, your purpose, and your very presence. May we be what you have designed us to be for your glory. In Jesus name. Amen.